Welcome to my talk for Full Stack Fest, FutureJS. Uh, it's about uh, web VR. Uh, my name is uh, Jaume Sanchez. Um, I'm the spy on Twitter. Um, I work for a company called Be Real. It's a production company. We specialize on online uh, web experiences. We've worked uh, throughout the years on, on many projects with uh, um, WebGL, Canvas, uh, Web Audio, uh, many interesting interactive things. Uh, in my personal page, I have all kind of experiments with, with new technologies and experiments. Um, my relation with, with WebVR, my interest with WebVR comes, of course, through 3D graphics. Um, I have a background on... on uh, let me, by the way, start my timer because that's important. Okay. Um, I come from the... From the Demo scene, if, you're, if you know what it is, uh, it's an underground movement of creating real-time uh, graphics and, and audio, uh, trying to explore the limitations or the capabilities of any given platform. It used to be for PC, Amiga, Commodore, but now there's, there's a bit of a revival with the web, uh, with Canvas and, and WebGL being, being available. Um, so, of course, when, when, when we come to explore these new technologies, uh, it's very interesting to see that there's these new devices and they're really providing a new uh, a revival of, of, of virtual reality as we knew it in a couple of decades ago, and maybe this time it will catch on. So, mm, I'm going to try to explain a bit. Uh, I'm going to do an introduction on, on VR, what we usually call VR. Uh, we know it's, a, it's an umbrella term of many different techniques, many different approaches, um, because basically we, we all understand what virtual reality is. We are all, all familiar with it through movies and, and books and, and many stories. But w what it is exactly? I mean, it's the act of replacing reality uh, to a user by basically creating a, a new visual input, so replacing what everybody is seeing uh, with images and linking it with some kind of positional tracking, which makes that the movements in real life match with the movements in the virtual world. So it creates this seamless uh, identification or presence with the virtual world. But of course, like if you have a flying experience in which you're using a fan uh, to create the sense of, of wind, that fan is literally, like it's not really part of the VR solution. It's something that you use. So where's, what's VR, what it's not. Um, let's go back to the kind of beginnings of, the, of the, what we know as VR, like when it got into TV and, 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 and movies. This is kind of the best snapshot I've been able to find of what was back in the era. Uh, it's really not entirely representative, but basically we had uh, CRT, small CRT monitors. That's why the, the headset is so, so, so deep. Um, they weighed a, a ton, so they usually needed some kind of counterweight for the, the, for the user to be able to move their head. Um, and there was a, f a few of these kind of weird devices to track hands and arms positions. But in, in itself, it's basically this display uh, and a set of sensors in the casing that uh, follows the tracking, the positional tracking and the rotational tracking. So whatever your head is doing, it's tracked by, this, by these devices. So we got in the 90s a lot of these kinds of things, which you've stopped seeing, but maybe it will, it will come back. Um, and the things that the headsets were pretty heavy. The graphics resolutions was not very high. Um, the sensors, especially, for, in order for virtual reality to work, you need a lot, uh, like a very, very small latency. Latency is the, the time that it takes from one signal in the sensor in the physical world until it gets through all the chain until the last pixel it's updated on screen. So what we know now it's over 20 milliseconds, which is really, really uh, low latency. Over 20 milliseconds, we start to get some kind of desynchronization between what, we, what our brain perceives of this virtual reality and what actually is happening. So it creates some kind of lagging and dizziness. So basically what we had is this bulky headset with lag rigs, and the graphics weren't um, entirely amazing because um, most of, if you remember, the, the GPU, before the GPU revolution in the mid-90s, 
the graphics, the 3D graphics were really not that good. I've been able to find, I was looking for a picture of a game I remember playing around 93 or something like that. It looks something like this. And this is not because of the JPEG. It was actually like this blurry, but with lots of scan lines. Because you were basically watching a CRT up close, which is probably not very good. You know when they told you not to get close to the TV? That's what we were doing back then. So that's the thing. It's, it's, it's really, I mean, it's not entirely convincing. You know, it's not like it can replace uh, reality. But the good thing is that if you get very low latency, so it reacts very responsibly to what you do, it doesn't matter the quality of the graphics, because your brain thinks, oh, it, that's right, I'm in a world that it's low polygon now, but it's a real world. But that didn't happen back then because we had very laggy rigs. So there was all these kind of things. So people kept uh, going and, and trying to experience VR. Usually you go to the arcades. That w those were very expensive uh, um, matches that you had to pay for, for, for a few minutes of, of basically uh, dizziness and drowsiness after, after playing one of these. But people kept, kept going uh, even though um, all these uh, uh, disadvantages because it was modern, because it was the future, because it was cool, but it didn't catch on, basically. So the problem is that it really left you sometimes very, very dizzy with, like, for a few hours. Uh, it, it was expensive because those were dedicated hardware machines with high maintenance cost. And the, frag the content was pretty much fragmented. There was no way for a developer to create content that would run on anyone's computer. That was out of the question. You had to develop for specifically that kind of thing or the other kind of thing, you know? So far away from what we would consider a consumer uh, approachable um, solution. So it kind of went away. For, for a while, for, for, during all these years, there's been a head-mounted displays for virtual reality. There's, Sony has been, been producing them, but not really improving them. But the concept of virtual reality kept on society through movies. Like, okay, how many people can identify the picture on the bottom right? What movie is it? What movie is it? The Matrix. What about the top right? Strange Days. What about the top left? Jeremy Monik. And what about the bottom left? The Low Mower Man, yeah, the best, worst virtual reality movie ever done. <laughs> if you haven't seen it, I don't recommend you to watch it because it's probably a painful experience after all these years. It's, it's good. It's not as bad as virtuosity. So we, we kept having all this, all this, all this, um, um, it wasn't the popular culture. So we can skip, back, uh, skip forward to 2012. Uh, Lucky Palmer was, um, working on the meant to be seen 3D forums, uh, explaining how he was working on his um, garage, uh, creating a new kind of prototype for virtual reality. And I think by his sixth uh, iteration, he had the idea of uh, crowdsourcing this prototype as a, as a do-it-yourself kit of virtual reality um, and posted the, the idea. And people were like, okay, that's cool. Another, another one, I worked this time. And then John Carmack, if you, if, you, if you don't know who John Carmack is, you only have to know that uh, he's basically a legend in 3D graphics. He's single-handedly advanced the, the gaming 3D engines and the first-person shooter genre uh, by itself, creating Doom and Quake and many variations of, of 3D engines. So he, he was also in the, in the MTV SD 3D, MTV, meant to be seen in 3D forums. And thought, oh, that's cool. He had been running his own experiments, and then he took, he asked for a prototype, did some tests, some pretty fancy tests, like uh, taking a, a video camera and recording uh, with a program that would change the output of the screen when pressing a button. So he would record that, press the button, and then measure the frames that it would take since he had pressed the button until the last pixel had changed. And then he had some solutions for, for improving latency, and in the end he said, it's good. I think I, think I dig this and people collectively lost their mind. So the Kickstarter went pretty successfully. They, uh, they gained, they raised uh, $2.4 million, like almost 1,000% of what they wanted to, to get. Um, and so they, they released the, the DK1, uh, 
that's this development kit for developers. There's, it was not for a consumer. Uh, it was basically for developers to, to try the first thing. And basically, the rest is history, as they say. There's the, let me see if I can reuse this a bit, because it's probably, I cannot. OK, trust me. There's the DK2. There's the Crescent Bay prototype. This on the bottom left is the, the actual CV1, the Oculus Rift itself. That's the HTC 5 from, from, from Steam, from Valve, sorry. Uh, Facebook bought Oculus, and, and then here we are. So um, VR now, what are we doing? We basically, yeah, I know. I'm way ahead of you, because we always use this image. It's pretty funny, right? It's pretty funny to use this image, because it's the, the amazing of uh, future of virtual reality. But I found a maybe better representation. <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> that's maybe the future of VR. I don't know. Um, I'm not judging. So yeah, back to our friend. So we have the. <laughs> that's true, by the way. That happened in Japan. So. We still have the, the display. Uh, so, so the casing has the, the lenses in front of a flat display, because displays nowadays are much better, so we don't have to use uh, tubes anymore. Um, the sensors are also in, in the casing are much better, much, much faster with lower latency, because the, both the technology, uh, I mean, the, the military has spent a lot of budget in, in, in this kind of things. Uh, and, the, and the production process has actually improved, so, so we have a pretty neat solution in there. The only problem is that the graphics are being rendered on, the, on, on a CPU. So we basically have, we're tethered. This is, this is the, C, the DK2. So again, we have display, we have the, the positional and rotational tracking, and all this goes into an HDMI, HDMI uh, port, and the computer is rendering the, the, the graphics. So this is basically a display. It's not that dumb what it does. I mean, it's not just a screen, but the, the the gist is, is this. So, of course, then it means that you have to have a kind of a powerful computer because this has to be running, what they expect now, it's 90 hertz in stereo, so it means basically drawing the two different eyes at, at 90 frames per second. Um, Oculus has, a specific, has released a specification for how your computer should be, uh, how powerful it should be, and of course, many people still cannot uh, for that, but it's, it's right now their market is for gamers, so they probably can, can spend that. There's another, there's other different solutions like mobile VR. That's also something that Oculus has been working with Samsung. Uh, John Carmen has overseen, been overseeing this. It's the same idea still. The casing has the lenses, and, but the display and the um, rotational and positional tracking, the rotational, not the positional. It's on your phone, so it's, it's a note for. Uh, you just put it there and then use it. The great advantage is that you're not tethered anymore, so it's perfectly free uh, movement. The disadvantage is, of course, that it's not very powerful. It's not as powerful as many other computers. But we can, we can consider that those devices are pretty, pretty powerful, actually. So there's, there's, there's a lot of, of possibilities for, for that. And the, the hardware and the platform will just uh, improve. Um, it also comes with a, with a remote, like a controller, which uses Bluetooth, so the linking is direct, and it creates a much more uh, immersive experience by just being able to take a, a, a pad and play with virtual reality. It's pretty amazing, this, this one. Uh, it also brings the, the funny thing that it has its own birded guy funny face. That's what happens when you use the, without a note. Um, then there's the, the cardboard. The cardboard, it's, it's a Google solution uh, approaching this problem. It removes the, the actual casing and assumes that uh, basically everybody has a, um, a mobile phone, so the platform is already there. You just put it inside. Uh, there's lenses. Uh, this is called cardboard because it's made of cardboard. You can make it out of a pizza box. There's instructions, or you can buy it on Amazon. Now, nowadays, there's plastic ones that can, that can fit uh, different sizes, so the iPhone also works. This is the second generation. It's got a, a, a button uh, to modify because this one uh, used the interaction by having a magnet, uh, and you would, uh, when pressing this, you would create a disruption on the sensors, and that would be interpreted as uh, a tap. 
so not very uh, available to all the different phones. And basically, development for VR nowadays, we're using uh, Unity and Unreal Engine are the masters. Um, and basically, what most people are developing are 360 videos, so they shoot it or render them, and you're basically staying and looking around in an experience that drives you through, through whatever it's been created. Immersive experiences, which can be roller coasters or medical visualization, data visualization, they're using uh, VR to treat uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, for instance, by exposition, by exposition, yeah. Or, of course, gaming. Okay, so what is web VR? Now we get to the specifics of, of web VR. So most people ask, is, is, is just the idea of having VR in, in the web? Is, is it just a set of, of guidelines of how we should create content when we want to put VR in the web? Is it, is it a kind of a hyperspace in which our browser is in 3D and we can browse the internet in 3D? So web space VR, it's basically virtual reality in the web. So basically every page that is running a stereo and it's responding to the user somehow position of, of rotation of the head like a cardboard, for instance, that's web space VR. But web VR, in one single word, it's an API. It's a JavaScript API. It enables the web to be a platform for VR using JavaScript in the browser. It's basically, uh, given that the different options in the browsers are not designed for high performance and low latency, they come up with a set of solutions that the browser implements so you can actually use the HMDs and the sensors. So web VR. What's the advantages? It's still the advantage of the web content on top of VR. You don't need to install content. You don't need a plugin. You can address a lot. As a developer, you can address a lot of, of platforms. It's universal as the web it is. And basically, the most important thing, you can link content. The URLs are, are what makes uh, all this discoverable. So you're not mm, in a single application you're in, the in, the, in the net. So there's some examples here. Uh, I'm going to show you one of the first, which is, and hopefully it should work if there's connection. Let's see. Because most of this stuff, it's, it's, it's online. But this is basically, um, is it loading? You can see, for instance, that the, this, this is uh, Brandon Jones, uh, Quake 3 uh, viewer of the BSP, of the levels. Uh, and there's this option for VR, but I think it's taking very long. Okay. Okay. Well, we can leave it here. Uh, let's see this one other. It's basically uh, this is a Mozilla uh, approach to VR. They created the Moz VR project. They, uh, Josh Carpenter uh, and Mr. Dupe created this this flyby demo um, showing how what, what was possible. I'll talk about this later. Oh man, not super fast to be. Honest. Okay. Anyway, believe me, they're pretty. They're pretty cool. There's more. There's uh, Primrose, which is a, a text editor on, on virtual reality. There's Shader Toy. Shader Toy is a it's a web for a, for community of shader creators that has recently added VR support. In Spirit is an experience by and boring by Arturo Paracuellos. Very nice. Um, there's um, virtual reality videos. These are these are the links for 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 all these uh, projects. So the WebVR API has a specification, has its entry on the Mozilla Developer Network. You can check it there. Uh, it basically started when uh, Vladimir Vukicevic from Mozilla, uh, Vlad is a software engineer, basically in charge of everything that has to do with um, graphics, uh, canvas, uh, gaming. And you might know him from starting this little thing called WebGL. So he, he got that started and basically took the SDK from the, uh, from the Oculus and integrated in a nightly build of Firefox. And Brandon Jones from Google, another software engineer working on the WebGL uh, Chrome team, did the same with, uh, with Chromium. So now we can download the versions that, of those browsers that run all the required things. So WebVR is a very simple API. I mean, it, it's not simple in the sense of, of, of I mean, it's, 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 it's fairly small. It doesn't do a lot yet, but it can, it can grow. It basically allows the JavaScript uh, layer to interact with those uh, uh, headsets, the dedicated hardware. As we say, this is uh, 
is one of the gig hours, but it can be more. And it's not very clear what exactly will be. But for now, we assume that there's these things. So how you use the API, you basically have in Navigator, you get the get VR devices. It's a promise uh, that when, when fulfilled, it returns the list of devices that are in the system as a, usually a list of either an HMD, heads-mounted heads display virtual reality device, and a position sensor uh, virtual reality device. If you don't have one, you don't have one connected, it creates a Moculus Rift, which fulfills the, the data. It doesn't have the, the positional information, but it's there so it, you can still develop. So the HMD VR device uh, has a few interesting uh, methods. Basically, you can query it for the eye parameters, for the left or right eye, and you then get the, the, the geometry like the definition of the geometry for that, for that uh, device, how the lenses work, how, how you can construct your camera. This is more into the, the realm of 3D graphics. Don't worry, but the information is there. It just gives you a, a, a fairly nice de definition of what you can do with that uh, lens system. And then you can set it based on your, on your scene. And the position sensor VR device, you can also ask for the state and it will retain, return all these, all these different methods, angular acceleration, orbital velocity, linear acceleration, velocity, the orientation and the position. The position, okay, this is wrong. Orientation will be a dumb quaternion, a timestamp. So you basically query it and it's gonna be giving you the, the different orientation of, of, of the device. So you get your camera, which is constructed based on the physical attributes of this uh, uh, HMD, of the display, and then move it in your virtual world with the information that the sensor is providing. So this is fairly complex, and you're basically not building your whole 3D engine. Most people don't do that. So the same thing that happened with WebGL, that it kind of evolved and, and, and matured thanks to 3JS. 3JS is a JavaScript library created by Mr. Dub that you can use for basically creating 3D graphics and addressing WebGL without all the different complications of the, of the API. Um, so with uh, the most VR project, they started this VR effect, is this VR controls, which is a, an abstraction on top of the renderer of 3JS and the device uh, orientation control so you can uh, render on an HMD and take an HMD as an input for rotation of the camera. Okay, so if you've ever coded for 3JS, basically you first create a renderer, which is, is gonna get your graphics on the display. You attach it to, the, to, the, to, to, your, to your document, so it creates a canvas and puts it on screen. You create a scene, which is what is gonna hold all the information of your world. Create a camera, create some controls, in this case, orbit controls. Basically, you can rotate around your scene. Create your geometry. In this case, this create world uh, function just put some cubes on the, on, on, on the scene, and you just run your render loop. With the request animation frame, you go over, update the controls, which take the information from, the, from whatever you've done with the mouse, updates the camera, and then render, uh, renders the scene. So basically what you get is this. This is a 3D JS scene. You can rotate it, you can, you can zoom in and out, okay? So this would be your basic code. It of course get, gets more complicated, but this is fairly the basis. So what we do for, to enable this for web VR is fairly similar. The only thing that we do is the controls that we instantiate are VR controls, and we specify the camera we want those position and rotation be assigned uh, to. And the effect, it's uh, a VR effect, and we specify the render that is gonna take over. We set the size, and basically, instead of rendering uh, with renderer, we render with the, with the effect. We also need to add the double click action to enable the full screen, because uh, to take full screen in a browser, we need uh, the user's uh, action. So this is basically like this. This is, if I double click, I go into VR mode and maybe everything crashes or something like that. Okay, this is interesting. Window. Ah, oh, man, this is always like that. Where are we? Where are you? Okay. Awesome. Okay. Bye. Bye. Mm. 
Okay, let's try now. Shit. <laughs> okay, well, it won't enable the full screen, so you won't see the, dis the distortion, but the thing is that it, this is still uh, uses the, the positional orientation on the track. And basically, you can, you can move the camera too, so it, it detects where, where you are. So this is what it takes to, to take the original scene and, and turn it into a web VR enabled uh, scene with uh, 3JS. So now that we're already rendering stuff, now it's important to know that there's this very uh, um, important thing to remember. So when we are doing 3D graphics in a 2D display, the actual sizes of things don't really matter because you are not able to really perceive uh, scale with depth cues. But when we're doing 3D with WebVR, uh, we really need to stick to, to sizes. So the agreement is that one unit, one unit in the virtual world, one unit in JavaScript, it's one meter. So keep in mind that because if not, you might have an, a, scene, a scene that when you use it on the VR device, um, it might look like you're putting your head in a very small uh, scene or it's a huge screen and you're a dwarf. You can use that on your, at your own advantage, but you have to be aware of that. So um, also don't move the, the user without their actual <laughs> interaction. Yes, uh, latency is important in this, in this sense because if not when you're moving, like your brain automatically assumes that when you're doing an action on a controller, uh, your head and your physical um, body will react to that. So if there's lag, you start to get dizzy and yeah, it gets really, really pretty terrible. Uh, when you're a seasoned veteran, you just go like this that still feel kind of nauseous. Cool. So what about cardboard? What about cardboard? Uh, it's kind of same thing, actually. You instantiate the renderer, add it to your, to your DOM, create your scene, create your camera, and the controls in this case are device orientation controls, which use the gyroscope on the, on the, on the phone. And the effect, instead of a VR effect, it's a stereo effect. But for the rest, it's the same. So I'm gonna show you another demo that is, should work. Uh, I'm gonna simulate uh, a Nexus 5. And I'm gonna, so this is basically what you would see on your, on your phone, right? And if you use it with, with the lenses and your head with the phone put it there, it's actually, it's actually pretty nice. I mean, it's, it's one of the best solutions for, for straight, straight uh, uh, VR. So now we're talking about cardboard. It's definitely more accessible. It's more available now that it works with Nexus devices, with iPhone devices, with many Samsung devices. But it still has the limitations of the web and the mobile web. So uh, we have to find ways to keep the display awake. We cannot. St we still don't have control over how the screen uh, behaves from the browser. Um, we don't have touch because the the screen is inside this case. Uh, performance is really not good. Um, we we have to apply lens distortion by using shaders on the mobile, which no, might not be the best of solutions on WebGL. Uh, the sensors are far from, from ideal yet, so there's lots of things to, to figure out. We don't have lock orientation, uh, orientation screen orientation uh, lock API yet, so we can say, no, I want this to behave on, to act only on, on landscape. So all these things that you've seen, we have kind of the same thing with different, diff uh, different controls, different renderers, different effects. So Boris Moss from, from, from Google had this idea of the, the responsive web VR, because it, it's, it's really pretty dumb that we have to create content that could run on many devices because they have the, the features, but we don't actually have the, we're not reading the right sensor, we're not using the right output. So he wants to do this, uh, right ones run on every, VR headset and came up with the VR boilerplate. Let me see if this is still. A new starting point for building responsive web VR experiences that work on popular VR headsets and degrades grateful on other platforms. It's built on top of this 3JS VR effect and VR control and it implements two interesting things. One is web VR polyfill, which creates this, unifies this kind of, of different uh, devices and, and, and HMDs in a cardboard HMD device, a gyro position sensor VR device, which kind of abstracts the device orientation events, and the mouse keyboard position sensor VR device. It's a mouthful, but that basically means that you can use a VR scene even though you don't have 
a rotational position sensor by using the keyboard. And then the Web VR Manager, which is pretty useful, that establishes common UI elements. You've been seeing that there's this kind of button that, you, that it tells you, go into VR mode, go into cardboard mode, go into uh, Oculus mode. Um, it implements VR best practices. So for instance, on the cardboard, it, it helps you tell the user, don't put it on, 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 on portrait, put it on landscape, or it goes the, handles the transitions to full screen on every platform. So what happens with uh, the input devices? There's, there's lots of input devices, and every VR solution comes with its own. Uh, they will basically be processed as position sensor VR device, but there's many other options that we can use in the browser just using JavaScript. So there's the keyboard and mouse that we've seen, there's the limb motion that tracks uh, uh, your hands. It gives you a, a kind of complex representation of, of those hands, so it might, be not, might not be straightforward to implement on, on, on VR, even though it's very powerful. Mayo, it's a bracelet that tracks your, your, your arm movements and your hands by, by reading the muscles and nerves reactions. We have gamepad controllers. Um, there's the, the, seriously, this is pretty annoying. Okay. Um, okay, so ideally, okay, wait. This happens a lot. Like it's got some kind of, Seriously, okay. So, well, this is, this is a, an Xbox uh, controller. So you plug it and there's the gamepad API that basically you can query to get the state of your, let's see if I can get back to those. No, it's really. Okay, this was working, but all this mess of, of, of USB is probably adding a lot of interference or something. Amazing, thank you. So basically, you can, you can, you can move your, your camera with, with, with a controller. And it's important that there's low latency, because basically, when you press a button, it has to take really, really low, uh, small time in order for the user to not get dizzy. OK. So another, another thing it's, uh, you can use, for instance, scrolling. So there's this, this device. It's the, the PowerMate. It's basically a scrolling wheel. And you can use it for interaction because the important thing with, with VR is that um, once you are immersed, once you are, in, you are in VR, you basically lost complete track of your surroundings. So it's not like you can easily find the keyboard if you move around. And usually you move around because you're looking uh, everywhere. So this would be, that's, it's not gonna work, of course. Anyway, okay. Okay. So this will be what you were seeing, and you can you can you can play with this. It's upside down. See, if you if, if you were if, if you do that to someone wearing a VR device, you probably screw with their head because like I'm upside down and nothing is. So so it's it's like this basically. Or same thing can happen um, with this. Let's see if we do the same. This would be like a like a like a game that you can play in the in the browser. You can rotate. It's pretty simple. Like if you, all these all these demos come later. Find me and, and we'll run them properly, and you can use them in the with with the VR. It, they're pretty fun. Okay, so what about cardboard? Um, so we need to improve the shake detection from the generation one, which it's not available for the browser because I mean we, you will have to read the the sensors, but it's really not a nice solution. We have to work around the limitations of the generation two, which basically that button creates this kind of, of touch on your screen, but it's not amazing. We've tried computer vision, because cardboard is a nice solution, usually has a camera, and with uh, get user media, you can, you can read the camera. It's pretty intensive, CPU intensive, but you can still create some, some interesting solutions by tracking uh, AR marks and markers and things like that. Uh, we can use voice recognition. It also, it also works. It's a bit messy when there's many people in the same room using the same solution. Uh, we can use WebRTC control, so we can have a server that reads the gamepad or something and creates a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, connection with the, with the phone and, and basically sends the, the, the position and the, and the rotation. It might have a lot of, 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 of latency, so that's important to, to think. Uh, worth noting, most of this only applies to Android because uh, Safari iOS doesn't support most of these features, but still, it will probably get there. So one interesting thing, 
while we're talking about transforming the camera with sensors, this would be the normal code when you create uh, a camera controls and re-render it with it. But what happens then is that your head, this is your head on the virtual wall, gets positioned in the origin. So you cannot move it because basically the device is telling itself how it moves. So if you want to put it somewhere else in the scene or you want to move it around or you want to move it with a, with a controller in 3JS, what you have to do is create a 3D object, a dummy, and then have the camera be uh, a child of that dummy. And then you can move the dummy around in the scene and that will set the origin for the position so you can look whatever you want to be. Uh, important in immersion, 3D sound. We have the web audio API, pretty stable, pretty nice. There's these articles about uh, how to create a spatial audio, how to set the position. Um, there's, that was the subject of my, of my talk last year about web audio, but you can use 3D audio, you can use cones of, of hearing, you can use, uh, you can even calculate, you calculate the Doppler effect of moving uh, listeners and, and emitters. What about cardboard? Yes, it works. We have web audio API. We have web audio API even on iOS, so good. So, What's the, what's the future for, for web VR? What's, what are the challenges? Uh, there's actually many. Technically, uh, we cannot be sure that we can hit the performance that is, the performance that is required for nice, non-dizzying uh, VR, which is 90 hertz under 20 milliseconds of latency. Um, maybe Stephen later has an opinion of that. We'll see. Uh, do we need a declarative language for web VR using HTML and CSS? Mozilla has been exploring this kind of media query that you can define how a page would behave if it's in a web VR enabled, uh, no, sorry, in a v VR enabled uh, environment. So, so you can add um, a specific kind of markup or uh, panorama that, you, that, it, that shows on the, uh, as an environment of the, of the page, so it's more immersive. Uh, we definitely need tools and libraries for developers uh, it's, it's probably gonna be a complicated road to figure all this out because it's basically all is new, all is really the future. We need to figure out best practices. Basically, how do we establish, that that's also applies to VR, how to create the directional communication patterns. How do we, we don't have, uh, we don't have, we don't have a click, we don't have a, a way of, of pressing things or we have it like this, maybe this is not the right thing. What we're doing right now, it's, it's focusing on an element in 3D and then there's a timer. It might be the best solution, it might be a better solution. Um, you might walk into a 3D virtual element like a wall and your body is gonna reject that. So we have to find a way of moving the user from that situation without actually moving them, uh, even creating dizziness. So there's the blink in which everything fades out and you fade in again in, a, in the original position. We have to be aware of the security concerns of this kind of web VR enabled web. If you were browsing the web and we got into, imagine getting into one of these scare jump sites in VR. I mean, we're probably gonna kill someone by a heart attack at some point. We have to be aware of that. So basically, as a as, as, as summary, the hardware is in flux. It's, there's still no uh, consumer version of this, of this product. The API, uh, the API is in flux because we're figuring this out. The implementations are in flux, and it's a pain because what was working, uh, it doesn't work after a few, after an update, after the update the, the SDK, after you update your Chromium. Uh, the hardware hasn't found a user base yet, but yet there's a ton of content. If you check VR, there's a lot of, of an amazing amount of, of things out there, and the web can be part of that. So it's really a new world to invent, so. Go on, create. Might introduce nausea. It might make you hallucinate. I guarantee that. But it you feel all warm and fuzzy inside. And I'm not going to show the demo. I'm going to show the demo. But seriously, come try this. When you can, go find me. This is amazing. It's so simple, but it's, it's amazing what you can do with this. So that's me. Thank you. Those will be the slides if you have any questions. <laughs>